Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Merit Chanow, the Dean of SIPA, for helping to organize this panel. I'm Tim Fry, the director of the Harriman Institute, and we are co-sponsoring this uh, important panel on perspectives on uh, Ukraine. Uh, we're really fortunate today that we have just a very diverse group of experts um, to give us some insight into the, the crisis as it unfolds in real time. And given how complicated and multifaceted this crisis is, we thought it was very important that we bring people who, who have expertise to bear on security issues, on energy issues, on uh, the view from Ukraine, on international security. Um, so this is a panel I think will, will spark, I think, a lot of uh, discussions. I don't want to take up too much time, but what I'd like to do is just briefly uh, introduce our speakers, and uh, I apologize in advance. Each of them is far more uh, distinguished and esteemed than I will give them credit for, but you can also look up their bios uh, anytime you like on the internet and learn more about them. So I'll just give a brief uh, introduction. Um, and then I'd like to uh, uh, um, uh, throw out at least a question or a thought or a comment for, uh, for our panelists, perhaps to chew over. They can feel free to uh, uh, decline to do so. Uh, um, and then you guys in the audience can ask them the question again uh, afterwards if they, uh, if they don't answer it. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by um, uh, uh, working out from Ukraine. Uh, 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 our first speaker will be uh, Ambassador Valery Kuczynski, who's a retired career diplomat. He was the uh, permanent ambassador from Ukraine to the United Nations uh, for many years and has commented widely on Ukrainian politics and knows as much about Ukraine as anybody. And we're very fortunate to have him because not only does he know a lot about Ukraine and domestic politics, but he also brings to bear his uh, considerable experience uh, uh, as a diplomat. Um, then uh, uh, we, we will hear from uh, Jan Schweinar, who is the Professor of Global Political Economy and Director for the Center for Global and Economic Governance, and he's one of the most distinguished experts on economies in transition, and uh, is also distinguished by being a prominent uh, player at one time in uh, politics in the Czech Republic. Uh, so he will be able to bring not only his economic expertise, but also to be able to view this crisis from the point of view uh, uh, of an East European. Um, next, we have uh, Professor of Practice Peter Clement, who comes to, C uh, to CIPA from the CIA Directorate of Intelligence, where he was for eight years the Deputy Director for Intelligence for Analytic Programs, and he was responsible for, at various times, for briefing people whose last names include Cheney, Rice, and Hadley. <laughs> so these are pretty influential uh, uh, people. He has a PhD in Russian history and is a longtime expert on, uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, U.S.-Russian relations and on politics uh, within Russia. Um, and moving out to discuss the, the energy issue, we have Jason Bordoff, who's Professor of uh, Professional Practice in International and Public Affairs and the director for our recently created <coughs> Center on Global Energy Policy. And before coming to Columbia, he was a special assistant to the president and senior director for energy and climate change on the staff of the White House. So he brings uh, not only his distinguished legal background, career in consulting, and a career working in uh, a number of different uh, uh, high-level positions uh, in the executive branch in Washington, he also will help us understand the energy aspect of this, uh, uh, of this potential crisis. And then finally, we have Richard Betts. Uh, uh, of the Political Science Department at uh, Columbia University. He's the Leo A. Schifrin Professor of War and Peace Studies and uh, Arnold A. Saltzman Professor of War and Peace Studies and the Director of the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. And he's an expert on American foreign policy and international securities and crisis bargaining in particular. So that's our strategy. We're going to start with Ukraine and then work our way back out uh, to big global issues. Um, just to throw a couple of uh, questions out there, um, for, if we think about Ukrainian politics, and the one issue that we might want to spend some time thinking about is the role of the, uh, what we might call the right wing or more uh, nationalist elements within the Ukrainian government. 
Um, uh, if you were following the, the events from Moscow, one would think that they were the only people making decisions. If you're following the crisis from here, you would think that either they're not very influential or not very involved. Um, but this is an issue I think that we might want to, to think about, given that this is, uh, in some corners, an important motivation for kicking off the, um, uh, kicking off the events in Crimea. Um, if we think about for our experts in international relations, there's been a lot of talk of a new Cold War. Um, now, uh, this is not a time of, uh, of great, uh, one might argue, not a, a time of great ideological competition based on communism and capitalism uh, far, in far-flung corners of, of the world. Um, so maybe that's not what we have. But you know, a lot of people have made the argument that after this event, relations between the US and Russia are not going back to where they were, say, prior to 2008 prior to 2012, prior even to uh, January uh, 2014. So we might want to think about what are the implications of this crisis, not just for uh, US-Russian relations, but for international politics more generally. For example, if we think about the role of the UN, um, uh, since the UN has played very much a background role uh, in, in this crisis, and this has been an important part of Russian foreign policy in recent years, using the, their uh, veto in the United Nations as an important leverage in international bargaining, does the small role that the UN has played in this particular crisis then uh, lead to a diminishment of that institution as a player uh, in international bargaining? So these are just a few random uh, uh, thoughts that I thought that we might uh, want to talk about, and I'm sure there'll be many questions as well uh, from the audience. I've asked each speaker to, go, to speak for eight or 10 minutes. We know that's a criminally short uh, uh, period of time, but we do want to have uh, time for discussion. So we'll start off with uh, um, uh, Ambassador Kuczynski and then move on through the lineup. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Valery Kuczynski. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tim. <clears throat> I think this is a very timely event. And in fact, what started in Ukraine over three months ago is a peaceful protest against the decision of the government to shelve the agreement with Europe turned out into outright revolt. In fact, the people's revolution against the corrupt and criminal regime of President Yanukovych. It further escalated into the biggest geopolitical crisis in Europe in the 21st century. My country, an independent sovereign state, a founding member of the United Nations, became a victim of an aggression. On the pretext of safeguarding the lives of compatriots, the Russian president gave orders to invade Crimea, an integral part of Ukraine. The possible use of Russian armed forces against other parts of the country was endorsed after a rubber stamp decision by upper chamber of Russia's parliament. This is being implemented in contravention of the existing international instruments, Ukrainian-Russian bilateral agreements, the United Nations Charter, and uh, in violation of the memorandum, 1994 Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances for Ukraine, to which Russia has been a party. Why did it happen? Dizzy with Sochi Olympic success <laughs> and wary of the outcome of Ukrainian revolution, its possible impact on Russia and on the near abroad, the Russian authorities unleashed a full-fledged military intervention against a neighboring state. President Putin seems to have decided that destabilizing the situation in Ukraine and undermining the new pro-European government in Kiev was worth any price, including sanctions, freezing of assets, economic and diplomatic isolation. Russia would retaliate. Putin was also sure that the West was not ready for military response. So contrary to expectations and <clears throat> forecasts of numerous <clears throat> political analysts who were practically unanimous in saying he wouldn't dare, he did. 
The Russian forces have practically seized Crimea, have surrounded Ukrainian military outposts and installations, <laughs> tried to disarm the personnel there. They attacked media and blocked TV stations, tried to seize a Ukrainian air base and other military <coughs> installations in Crimea, Ukrainian installations. The Russian military or the forces of Crimean self-defense, as they are sometimes called, <coughs> assisted the Crimean parliament to ad adopt an illegal decision of holding a referendum to joining the Russian Federation uh, by, Ukrainian, uh, by Crimean parliament and, in fact, approved the accession. The Ukrainian government strongly protested against foreign invasion, demanded an immediate withdrawal of Russian troops, and appealed for international appeal to international community for help. The decisions of Crimean Parliament were denounced and declared null, null and void. <coughs> Ukrainian armed forces had been put on full combat alert. Total mobilization was announced. This time, the world reacted vehemently to the unfolding aggression against a sovereign country. Very strong statements were made by foreign leaders. U.S. Secretary of State and British Foreign Secretary visited Kyiv, met with Ukrainian officials, promised support and financial assistance. Angela Merkel <coughs> and U.N. Secretary General had on several occasions discussed the crisis on the phone with Russian President. Prime Minister David Cameron expressed great concern. On Saturday, last Saturday, French President uh, received Ukrainian politicians Klitschko and Poroshenko in Paris. <clears throat> Ukraine's Prime Minister visited Brussels and will be visiting Washington tomorrow. Incidentally, on Thursday, he will speak in the Security Council of the United Nations here in New York. Uh, the EU offered 15 billion US dollars assistance program and expressed its readiness to sign the political part of the association agreement with Ukraine right now. The IMF <coughs> is negotiating <coughs> the opening of a credit line for Ukraine. The leaders of the G7 condemned Russia's clear violations of Ukraine's territorial integrity and suspended <coughs> preparations for G8 summit in Sochi. They called for direct negotiations and international mediation under the auspices of the UN or uh, OSCE. In trying to defuse the crisis, President Obama had lengthy telephone conversations with President Putin and called for immediate withdrawal of Russian troops. He authorized sanctions on individuals and entities responsible for violating Ukraine's sovereignty and for stealing Ukrainian assets. Travel restrictions on those were also introduced. The assets of a group of former senior government officials, including fugitive ex-president Yanukovych and his two sons were frozen in a number of European countries. Warrants for his arrest and for the arrest of his chieftains had earlier been issued by Ukrainian authorities. Last week, uh, Secretary Kerry had several meetings with his Russian counterpart Lavrov in Paris, Madrid, and Rome. Kerry stressed that uh, continued military escalation would close space for diplomacy. Kerry and Lavrov agreed to maintain intense contacts in search of a solution to the crisis, which is a good news. Yesterday, <clears throat> the Kremlin press service reported that Putin, Cameron, and Angela Merkel expressed <clears throat> in telephone talks the common interest in a de-escalation of tension in Ukraine. Uh, I quote the Kremlin press service. The question arises, can de-escalation be achieved 
by sending more Russian troops to Crimea, which is taking place right now. Putin made the point that the steps taken by the legitimate Crimean authorities are based on international law and aim to protect the legitimate interests of the population of Crimea, the Kremlin press service reported. According to Angela Merkel's spokesman, the chancellor asserted the German position uh, forcefully that the so-called March 16 referendum in Crimea is illegal. It is against the Ukrainian constitution and international law, end of quote. During a conversation with President Obama last week, uh, Angela Merkel said she doubts Putin is in touch with reality. Up till now, the uh, Russians have refused any contacts with the Ukrainian side, claiming they did not recognize the current government in Kiev. They also continue to assert that Maidan had been hijacked by the radicals, by the fascists, and the coup d'etat happened in Ukraine. Uh, Sergei Lavrov uh, did not attend the meeting of the foreign ministers of the signatory states of 1994 Budapest Memorandum held in Paris early in March. While in Paris, he also refused to meet with the Ukraine's foreign minister for consultations who was there. Uh, at Ukraine's request, the <coughs> UN Security Council had uh, held several sessions and consultations on the crisis with the participation of Ukraine's representative. During an open meeting 3rd March, all members of the Council, with the exception of one, Russia, expressed overwhelming support for territorial integrity of Ukraine and for peaceful dialogue. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon made a strong statement calling for restraint and cool heads. He sent his first deputy, Ian Eliasson, to Kiev. Secretary General Special Representative Robert Sari, who was in Kiev already there, was twice denied entry to Crimea. He was attacked by a mob of armed pro-Russian militants during his second attempt in Simferopol. A group of military expert from, experts from OSCE was also physically harassed and blocked from entering Crimea. <clears throat> Not much hope can be pinned on the Security Council because of uh, Russia's veto. There were precedents, though. When in 1993, the then Parliament of the Russian Federation approved a hideous <coughs> resolution on Sevastopol, the Security Council unequivocally expressed full and complete support for Ukraine. The situation was completely different then. As you remember, there was a serious confrontation between Parliament and the Russian government. Now, the Ukrainian delegation at the UN <clears throat> may work toward the adoption of General Assembly resolution. A special session of the General Assembly can be called. <clears throat> uh, now, Finally, uh, are there prospects for the peaceful solution? Very slim. The referendum in Crimea will be held. The results will very likely be falsified and the decision to join Russia will be endorsed. It would mean annexation and foreign occupation. What will happen next? How will Crimean Tatars, who constitute 12% of population, react? <coughs> they are staunch supporters of Ukraine's jurisdiction over <coughs> Crimea, remembering very well what happened at the end of 1944, mass deportation of the whole uh, Crimean Tatars population from the peninsula. <coughs> 
What about 24% of ethnic Ukrainians and the majority of the ethnic Russians who are not radicals or who are not involved in these self-defense forces acting now? Uh, if it happens, it will be another big headache for the Russian Federation, to put it mildly. Crimea continues to be financed from Ukraine's budget. The bulk of the supplies, including fresh water, come from the mainland. Will the Russian army stop at Crimea? Judging by the reports, the final military solution may still be implemented by Moscow. How will the world react? The Ukrainian authorities have clearly indicated not an inch of national territory will be ceded to Russia. The annexation will not be accepted under any circumstances. What's the outcome? Another hotbed of tension, another protracted conflict in the center of Europe? I'm a cautious optimist. I hope the common sense will ultimately prevail, even in the minds of great power chauvinists and autocrats. In the meantime, political and economic pressure on the Russian Federation should continue unabated. We must stop the aggressor before it's too late. Slava Ukraini. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Kuczynski. Um, All right. Um, I have a couple PowerPoints, so I'll stand up here. Thanks a lot. I am an economist by training, and so I thought I would just give a little bit of a view on the economic situation. And uh, uh, I think the ambassador <coughs> laid the ground very, very well from the beginning. I am an optimist normally as well, although in this case I am uh, hard pressed to find too much. Uh, optimism. Let me just give you a little bit of background. Ukraine went through a really tough recession in the 1990s, uh, leaving the centrally planned system, establishing capitalism. Rate of growth uh, picked up, very promising. And then, of course, the Great uh, Recession hit Ukraine as well. And um, then there was a period of growth, slowdown, but, you know, relatively optimistic, uh, mild growth type scenario until now, which unfortunately I think now will not be uh, forthcoming. Uh, unemployment uh, from high double digits gradually coming down to below 10, where it was expected to remain. Again, I am not sure, given the current problems and everything else that will ensue, that this relatively positive long-term trend uh, will, be, will be maintained. Hyperinflation that many of you remember as being the textbook example <coughs> in the 1990s uh, was contained and after that prices were relatively stable. The relatively stable means uh, they still fluctuated quite a lot as this picture shows. But nevertheless, again, in the last uh, five or so year, Ukraine managed to bring inflation under control. So overall, the picture, while not uh, bucolic, was you know, fairly optimistic, fairly positive for a country that was uh, uh, dealing with major, uh, large-scale, long-term problems and managing to, uh, to bring them uh, more or less under, under control. Um, this is the uh, linguistic division of Ukraine, and we're talking about the southern part, Crimean Peninsula, as being the focus of attention. Where I'm worried is that, in fact, the uh, significant uh, majority Russian-speaking uh, parts of Ukraine may be the subject of further um, um, possible uh, conflict, invasion, whatever you want. This is a topic for discussion. And incidentally, the eastern parts are also the parts where there is a lot of industrial might of Ukraine, Donetsk and so on and so forth. So, so this is something which strategically is really important to bear in mind in <coughs> when we, what we will see going, going forward. Um, the, just to give you a picture, Ukraine is a sizable country, uh, somewhat larger than Poland population-wise. I would bring your attention to the last two, uh, in the first column, the last two items, which show that Ukraine is about equally integrated with the EU in terms of foreign trade and uh, Russia. So it's particularly unfortunate if it's going to be forced at this point to um, uh, seize or diminish uh, uh, part of this uh, relatively fruitful uh, interaction going in, in both directions. 
Um, in terms of the political economy and, and strategy of it, uh, Russia enjoys clearly a number of advantages relative to Ukraine and EU in what's going on. It's a relatively uh, united, uh, nationalistically uh, oriented country. A lot of people in Russia uh, historically feel that Ukraine should be part of Russia, and uh, that uh, helps Putin dramatically. Putin, of course, has managed to uh, introduce significant control over media, political system in general, and has a very significant <coughs> control over a very significant share of energy resources for Europe. So Europe's options, uh, while not uh, while not non-existent, obviously are uh, contained there. I'd like to stress again what the ambassador mentioned, the Budapest Memorandum on Security uh, Assurances is very important. That's where Ukraine essentially promised to remove all of the Soviet-era nuclear weapons uh, that it had in its territory in return for um, uh, recognition of its sovereignty, which was signed not only by Western countries, but by Russia as well. So what we're dealing with is a question whether this memorandum is in fact standing or not, and to what extent. Um, the, um, what I already mentioned, there was a question of the trade option. Uh, Ukraine was negotiating since 2008 uh, this uh, deep and comprehensive free trade area, an association agreement with the European Union was rejected suddenly uh, in November 2013, and uh, uh, Russia offered a customs union with Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. And, uh, and the question is, you know, does Ukraine have to choose, and if so, in, in what way, as I indicated? And here you can see it clearly. Uh, the integration in terms of exports, very similar to um, Russia and Ukraine, very similar in imports, again, so both sides of, of the market. Um, Russian exports, and this is important now in terms of leverage, uh, most of it goes to the European Union. Russia would naturally not like to lose that market. On the other hand, it gives it incredible leverage because most of it is uh, gas, <coughs> oil, natural resources in general, which uh, Europe, uh, at least in the short run, uh, pretty desperately needs. Um, Russia, of, of course, imports from the European Union quite a lot as well. Uh, and so uh, it's also dependent on that, although for many of the products there is the world market where it could go to if uh, the EU were not to supply them. So the leverage there is somewhat less. Um, there will be others here who can say more about uh, Ukraine and uh, gas. Let me just stress that in terms of the politics and economics of it, Russia sets prices arbitrarily but judiciously. Uh, so with an unwanted government in Ukraine, prices were high. With a pro-Russian government, significant discounts uh, apply. So uh, that is an important thing to realize, uh, both looking back and going forward. Obviously, um, in the past, the, um, one of the few bargaining chips that the Ukraine government had in terms of the economics, political economy of power politics is that uh, significant power of natural gas that's consumed in the European Union was coming uh, from Russia by Ukraine. And while the share is declining, it's still quite important. Uh, the Russian response has been to try to build pipelines which avoid the territory of Ukraine and, um, and to try to negotiate uh, essentially seizing of control so that the Ukrainians would not control the gas transportation routes going to things. So here you can see the existing routes and the in dotted, uh, the uh, uh, ones that are proposed or under construction trying to bypass. Ukraine, and um, and so that obviously again in the medium term will be will be an important part. <coughs> Just as a sense, Europe's share of natural gas in uh, primary energy consumption quite significant, especially for some countries. On the very right, you have the average for the EU 28 countries, and uh, the dependence on uh, Russian uh, supply, where Russia is the sole supplier, as you can see, for a number of countries is uh, quite quite significant. Um, there is some storage capacity, varies dramatically by countries, uh, so it gives uh, Europe uh, a limited uh, amount of breathing space, but not uh, completely unlimited. So that's the constraints I was mentioning, and I think those will be important. Um, similarly, in terms of oil, primary energy consumption, Europe is uh, quite, quite dependent. So let me stop here in terms of the pictures and, and end with a, with a statement which I think is important, and that is that um, Russia obviously with the 
uh, its invasion of Crimea and uh, the stand that uh, Putin has taken and others is uh, very much bent on, I think, reestablishing its regional sphere of influence. Uh, we've seen it with respect to Georgia earlier and so on and so forth. So I think that this is complicating the situation considerably for Europe, but also for the United States, which uh, the U.S. was hoping that it could uh, withdraw somewhat from Europe, that the Europeans could handle all the situation there, that relations would be amicable enough, that uh, confrontations of various kinds could be avoided. I think that the current situation indicates that the situation is much more difficult and that resources uh, of all kinds will have to be deployed in order to maintain some equilibrium uh, power balance in, uh, on the Eastern Front. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Peter Clement, do you want to uh, say a few words? <clears throat> First, I, I need to start with a disclaimer. Um, as Director Fry just noted, I'm, I'm from the CIA. I'm here as a visiting professor for two years. Everything I'm about to say is obviously very, very unclassified. <laughs> um, and the views and analysis that I'm providing are solely those of my own. They don't necessarily reflect the views of the CIA or the US government. I like to think that frequently they're in sync. But uh, one of the nice things about my, my place of employment is that we actually do welcome a diversity of thinking on views, because that's the only way you can actually test different hypotheses. So I'm going to try to quickly run through why is Putin doing what he's doing? What have we seen so far in terms of Russian behavior that is suggestive of possible pathways for how this crisis will play out? I want to cover that in part one, Dif different ways this could play out. And then secondly, try to explain why Putin might be doing this, what he hopes to gain but I also want to note the huge, major risks that he's undertaking in doing whatever he's doing for whatever reasons. Um, first, uh, the issue of uh, there are certain triggering events that are going to happen very, very quickly. This crisis is not going to end in the next week or two weeks, and I would argue even the next month or two. Um, the obvious, most immediate one is the referendum in Crimea this coming weekend. That will actually tell us quite a lot about what Putin may or may not be thinking and where he plans on going. But beyond that, we also have um, what might yet happen in Kiev. There's this election that is slated for late May, how that plays out. Um, and then I would argue the thing that perhaps people are not thinking a lot about is what I would call the street factor. There are forces that have been unleashed now that may or may not be able to be controlled by any leadership, including Putin. Um, and particularly, I'm worried about Ukraine, or Crimea. Um, we have Mr. Oksyanov, the new prime minister, who has a very interesting checkered past, who has his own agenda. And I would remind you that in a lot of countries, sometimes local actors see their moment and they see their chance to advance a certain agenda. And they don't really care what all the big boys in the neighborhood think. They know how to get what they want and exploit a situation to their own end. And to me, that's very dangerous uh, because it, you get into that variable that we call uncertain factors, things that you hadn't anticipated that could suddenly go awry. So to the issue about Putin and what is he really up to, I think there's two or three ways you could assess what Putin might be trying to do. Uh, the first one, I know Richard Haas wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs just last week, um, which I very much agree with in terms of the possibility that what this is, is the seizure of Crimea is a bargaining chip. It's a near-term thing. It was an attempt to, to make something out of a very bad situation. What happened in Kiev since November, from Putin's point of view, is very, very disturbing. Uh, it's creating a bit of an instability, unpredictability in the leadership in Ukraine. We had a pro-Russia president who suddenly is literally overthrown by the street. And if you read Putin's other speeches about things like the Arab Spring and what happened in, say, Libya or Egypt, He's deathly afraid of the street. And I think we saw this in Moscow. Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but I sensed a strong neuralgia about those sizable protests that Putin found a way to tamp down. But I think that's probably his worst case scenario. Seeing that right next door in Kiev, 
and seeing Yanukovych literally thrown out overnight, very, very quickly um, in late February, had to be very um, discomforting at a minimum for him. So what does he do then to try to get Russia back as a force, a factor, in how this dynamic plays out in Ukraine? Well, you, you, you do this uh, spontaneous move by self-defense forces in Crimea who were very much worried because, after all, they heard about what those evil ultranationalists that Putin was complaining about in Kiev, they were going to take away the official status of the Russian language. And some of them even said, we're not really well about Russians at all. So Putin had a hook, as it were, a pretext to say, we need to do something about protecting our brethren here in Crimea. And he continues to deny that there's any Russian hand in this. This was all kind of a spontaneous movement on the part of these local actors. Now, if this is really just a bargaining chip, at some point you have to get to the bargaining table and, and play your cards and say, OK, what is it we want in return for this bargaining chip? We will agree to leave Crimea. We, of course, we're not there, so he won't have to negotiate too much. But we'll find a way to help <laughs> resolve the tensions in Crimea. And in return, uh, we, we want to be acknowledged as a, um, a neighbor that has to be recognized as an important factor. We still very, very much uh, worry very much about where Ukraine is headed. What, what kind of a international actor is it going to be? And I think underlying a lot of this is the issue of NATO. That, that perhaps what Putin is looking for is an ironclad written agreement that says there will never be a NATO in Ukraine. Maybe that's what this bargaining chip is about. Um, I don't know that I would give this high probability at this point. They have gone so far in, in uh, Crimea that if they go ahead with this referendum, and that's the key here, if they go ahead with that, I think it's much harder for Putin to then say, well, we didn't really mean it. We'll pull that back because we really want to talk about these other issues. So that's what I mean about there are going to be certain events here beyond anybody's control which are going to force certain big decisions to be made. So that's one possible explanation. Another possible explanation is the referendum goes ahead. Um, it gets incorporated into the Russian Federation as many have voted in the Russian Duma already to say, yes, we're ready to take them on. We'll do it as quickly as possible. And we'll give them a lot of financial assistance. There was a, a big announcement today. It was over a billion dollars in financial aid they were going to give to cri the new Crimea. Um, but then it stops. And so I, I would make a distinction here. This is a land grab, yes, but it's a single land grab. It's only about Crimea. And the real rationale here is everybody in Russia knows. And you can look at public opinion data going back more than a decade, you ask Russians whether Ukraine is an independent country. In 2010, 60 percent of the Russians polled said, no, no, it's not an independent, it, it's, it's not a separate country. We still think of it as kind of us. Um, the Crimea is a particularly sensitive point because, as I'm sure many of you have read by now, this was essentially a paper transfer uh, undertaken by Mr. Khrushchev, who in fact was Ukrainian himself. But it was a paper transfer in 1954. And of course, when 1991 occurred and the Soviet Union collapsed, that paper transfer actually became much more significant because now it belonged to you, the real Ukraine, not the Ukraine Soviet Socialist Republic Ukraine. Big difference. And so for some Russians, this Crimea thing was it should have never left in the first place. We're just taking back what's rightfully ours. This, this would be the narrative I would expect to hear. But then the question is, what happens after that? Do they stop there? Or do we see continued agitation about, well, there are all those other poor ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine who are worried about their future and how they will be protected and their rights in a future Ukrainian uh, new government. And if you see that kind of agitation continuing, then I think you have reason to be concerned that, well, maybe Putin has something bigger in mind. So if that's the path we're going down, then you have to ask yourself, well, what is it that Putin really wants? This is purely a hypothesis here, and I wouldn't give it high probability, but I also would not rule it out. Perhaps Putin is thinking about his legacy. He has been in, in either president or prime minister for 18 years when the next election occurs in 2018. Many people think he's going to run for real election. He may even have a 24-year tour here going to 2024. Maybe he's thinking about his legacy. He's the man who brought Russia back. He fixed the economy after 10 years of horrendous decline under Yeltsin. He helped to remodernize the Russian military. And by the way, he increased 
Russia's land space. He actually acquired a little bit of real estate to make it the greater Russia. He also made Russia force again on international affairs. We're seeing this in Syria. He can say in certain areas, Russia continues to be a player. Um, I recall from my days being a Soviet analyst, the Russians had this great phrase, or the Soviets had this great phrase, you know, and I think it might have been Gromyko, among others, who said, there cannot be any major event that goes on in the world in which we don't have a voice, in which we will have some role to play. And there are times when I hear little echoes of that in Mr. Putin, that he clearly, well, it's clear that he um, bemoans the demise of the Soviet Union, but he also thirsts for that recognition as a great player uh, on the world stage. So that's uh, the end of my comments on Putin's <coughs> possible motives and agenda. What are the risks? In my view, they're very, very significant. First of all, I hinted already at this issue about uh, local actors who take events into their own hands. There is a risk here that um, the locals, self-defense units or whoever, for whatever reasons, actually engage in violence. And then you start a dynamic that's harder and harder to control. People who previously seem to get along just fine, peaceably, and I would argue that would include Crimea, suddenly they, they have this uneasy feeling that we have to be wary of one another. Does this sound like any other place in the world you can think of, like, say, Syria? Somehow they all managed to get along until Mr. Assad had this narrative about what was really going on, which essentially forces different ethnic and sectarian groups to have to take a side. And in a weird kind of way, this referendum this weekend is forcing, I think as the ambassador just suggested, it's forcing people to have to pick sides. I'm not sure they all wanted to pick sides or want to have this vote, but there it is. Now they have to have one. So that's one risk. You, you, set, in, you set into play a very dangerous <coughs> dynamic of potential violence. Second risk, and this to me it's paradoxical, if Putin really wants to have an influence in whatever state Ukraine becomes, this is not the way to do it. It will have the opposite effect. The remaining Ukrainians, wherever that line is drawn, will have such a <laughs> intense, fierce dislike of their neighbor. If you want to push them closer to the West than NATO, I, I can't think of a better way to do it. So he may not be thinking through all this logically, I don't know, but he runs that risk if he continues, for example, if you were to go beyond Crimea to, to think elsewhere. Um, finally, that, that ethnic violence thing, I thought, if in fact he goes beyond Crimea and presses and agitates uh, in East Ukraine, then I think you run the aspect of serious violence that potentially could become a little bit of a civil war in the East. Uh, I think that's a worst case scenario, but it's one I, I certainly wouldn't take off the table. What are the risks? Okay, so if I were looking for other indicators, if we think that Putin has a much bigger agenda going even beyond Ukraine, where are the places I would look? This is why I have the slides. The dangerous thing about making the case for protecting my local citizens or compatriots of ethnic similarity, you start to look at the demography of nearby states. And there's already evidence that the Kazakhs are beginning to get a little nervous from what, looking at their local press about what's going on in Ukraine. One, they worry about what it means about the street overthrowing an autocrat, but they also worry does this give Russia a pretext for coming in to stabilize things, potentially putting in people they think are more reliable to manage things? Or even worse, if you go down this path, places that have a sizable Russian minority, northern Kazakhstan has a sizable Russian community. They're, they're pretty, um, let me see if I can get to the slide here. Very large border, as you can see. But if you look at the density up in the north, the, the purple and lighter purple areas are heavily, heavily ethnic Russian. Uh, and there have been Russian nationalists who've been writing for more than a few years, this really should be back with Mother Russia. So this is not something that would be that hard for them to raise as an issue if you had an unstable situation, say, in uh, Kazakhstan. I had the Baltic, the data on the Baltic states, if I can go back for a minute. Um, the obvious ones here would be Latvia and Estonia. And again, I'm not, I'm not seeing anything happening right now. But if I were looking for indicators, I would look very carefully at what the pro-Russian, ethnic Russian political parties are saying and doing inside particularly Latvia and Estonia. I'd also see what the Russians are saying in their media. Are they suddenly highlighting, gee, there are these terrible things going on in Riga. Incidentally, Riga is about 42% ethnic Russians, the capital of Latvia. 
So this is a very dangerous Pandora's box that Putin has opened. This doesn't necessarily have, have to happen at all, but I think it's something that, that prudent uh, outsiders need to be watching very, very carefully if they're trying to figure out, is Putin really just about Crimea or is that something more, or are his ambitions even bigger? I don't see any evidence of that yet, but uh, I've learned over the last few years since the Arab Spring to check all my assumptions at the door. Uh, there are very few things that I'm rolling off the table a whole lot anymore. Then finally, a final reason why I think Putin should be very, very nervous about opening the can of, gee, we need to be careful about the rights of minorities, particularly Russians. Well, if you look at the North Caucasus, there's a real minority problem. And it's usually, um, it's the Russians who are in a very small minority in a lot of these states. If you argue as you're arguing Crimea right now that the majority should somehow have the right to secede because they're worried about whatever outside factors, the majority here is really not Russian. Uh, I'm not sure I would say a whole lot about the potential in terms of assets and resources for these places to really go independent. But this has been a neuralgia point for a lot of Russians. There have even been some Russians on the more ultranational side who openly say, we should just forget the North Caucasus. A lot of these republics are more trouble than they're worth. We should let them go their way. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the closing point here would be that uh, I think Putin has unleashed a whole series of dynamics here <coughs> that are particularly unhealthy that could lead to very bad outcomes. Uh, I, we're not there yet, but certainly in Ukraine, I think we're well on the way. Well, we're already in the, a crisis. Hopefully, it won't get any worse. I'm trying to be an optimist, like the <laughs> ambassador. Uh, but as I suggest, th these forces have now been unleashed, and there are other players now. It's, it's not just Putin. And I will stop there. Thank you. Sure, I'll be uh, brief so we can sort of have a conversation and, and discussion. I'll just make a couple of points. I assume uh, I appreciate the invitation to participate, and I assume it was to comment uh, on sort of the role that energy is playing in the crisis. And as you saw in the numbers that Jan presented, um, Europe and Ukraine in particular uh, are heavily dependent on Russia for natural gas supplies, and natural gas has played an important role in the relationship between the EU and Russia for a long time, and particularly in the crisis that's playing out today, more so than for oil, uh, although they obviously produce and export a lot of oil. Oil is a much more fungible commodity, and so there's an impact on global prices, but you have uh, more diversity of supply and more sources of supply because it's much harder and more costly and you're more limited in how you can transport natural gas. So the EU gets a little under a third of its uh, natural gas uh, from Russia, about a little over half of that comes through physically through the Ukraine. The Ukraine gets about two thirds of its natural gas uh, from Russia and has very few other options uh, in terms of other sources of pipeline. There are not currently the capability to bring liquefied natural gas supplies into the Ukraine. So, uh, uh, they're in a tough spot if those supplies are cut off. And we've seen in the past Russia is not afraid to use its leverage, its monopoly uh, control of supplying natural gas as a lever, uh, most recently, uh, as recently as 2009, when it cut off supplies as part of a pricing dispute. Um, Ukraine is in a little bit better position today. There's been a mild winter. They have about four or five months of natural gas in storage, so there's a little bit more of a buffer. And I think the EU in general is in a better position than they saw in 2009. Uh, for reasons I'll, I'll come to uh, in a minute. So, uh, but it is it is a risk, and and so we've already seen. We, we also saw natural gas play a role in the development of this uh, of these protests and crisis in, in the first instance because it was, as you'll recall, uh, a, a promise from Russia of cash plus a cut in natural gas prices that originally led Yanukovych to back off from an association agreement with the EU, and that prompted the protests back in November. And sort of uh, we are where we are now. Um, so in response to this vulnerability, this dependence on Russia for natural gas, you've seen a lot of stuff being said <laughs> about what the US can do in terms of our newfound energy abundance to play a role in addressing this crisis and helping the Ukraine and helping Europe. And I just think it's helpful to take a moment and sort of separate rhetoric from reality and how we think about the role that uh, US energy abundance uh, can play. You've seen lots of calls for the export of uh, natural gas uh, to uh, the EU or the Ukraine 
And that is an important consideration uh, in the longer term, probably not as much in the immediate term. So the U.S. currently exports a little bit of natural gas uh, in the form of liquefied natural gas from Alaska, but we don't have the physical capability yet to export liquefied natural gas from the lower 48 states. It doesn't exist. It's not going to exist in the next few months. That's not because the U.S. government is standing in the way or the U.S. Department of Energy is standing in the way. The U.S. government has issued six permits. You need the permission of the federal government to export natural gas to countries with which we don't have a free trade agreement, and the government gives you that permit unless they find it's not in the national interest to do so. Uh, we've had a bunch of people who've applied for applications because we suddenly have this abundance of natural gas, and the price of natural gas in the U.S. is very low relative to the European and Asian price, so people understandably want to leverage that arbitrage and send this gas into the global market. So lots of people have applied for permits. The U.S. Uh, Department of Energy has approved six of those. The first project will come online next year, probably late next year. Uh, and then there will be several more that probably will come online, you know, a few years, toward, I don't know, toward later uh, on in the decade, 2016, 17, 18. Again, that's not because the U.S. government hasn't given them the permit they need. Uh, it's because of a bunch of things, including the fact that these are eight, ten, twelve billion dollar plants. They're very complicated. Uh, they take a lot of financing, and, and and it just takes a long time to put a project like that together. Now there are still 24 applications pending in the. Uh, application queue at the Department of Energy. They're disposing of an application once every two months, so it takes a long time to work through 24. So, you know, they should work, obviously they should work as expeditiously as they can. But in terms of the six that have already been approved, that's a total of about eight and a half BCF a day of natural gas. That's about three times what Ukraine currently imports uh, from Russia. So that's a lot of, of, of natural gas. Um, the, the, I think I said before, the situation uh, in uh, the EU today, I think, is better than it was just a few years ago in terms of Russia's ability to use natural gas as leverage or as a weapon, even before we export natural gas, because the U.S. has not uh, needed to import natural gas. So if you look back five, six, seven years, all the projections were for massive increases in the amount of natural gas that the U.S. was going to need to import, and that's why not long ago, lots of people applied for permits to import natural gas, and we started to see construction, um, we saw construction of facilities to import liquefied natural gas. And then all of a sudden, overnight, the U.S. energy landscape uh, changed in really transformational, historic ways, and we have an abundance of uh, natural gas now, and we don't need to import natural gas anymore. <clears throat> so all of these supplies of liquefied natural gas that people had anticipated would be sent to the U.S. from places like Qatar and elsewhere are now flowing elsewhere into the global market. Uh, into Europe in part. And so we're seeing more diversity of supply, more liquidity in the global market. And I do think that that uh, makes it uh, more challenging for Russia to use uh, the threat of cutting off gas supplies as a weapon because uh, the natural gas market is not yet like the oil market, but it's evolving to something uh, a little closer to it where you have some more options and some more diversity of supply. And so if supply is disrupted in one particular place, price is impacted, but you have some alternatives in terms of where you can get it. We've seen the amount of natural gas uh, sold from Russia into the European Union actually go up, not down. Their share of the European market was higher, reached, uh, was higher last year than it was the year before or the year before that. Um, and, and so you saw those numbers from Jan. But it's not only, don't only look at sort of how much gas the EU gets from Russia. The question is sort of what the options are and what alternative supply sources they have. And so right now there's a lot of liquefied natural gas that could go into Europe, but it's not because it's more profitable to send it into Asia where the price is higher. But in response to a true dis supply disruption, you would see the price respond. You would see those supplies get drawn into the EU instead. So people would pay a higher price for it, but it's not that you would physically have your access to natural gas cut off. Looking out into the longer term, the, the U.S., the, the global natural gas, liquefied natural gas market is still uh, tight today. Supplies are limited. When you look out toward the end of the decade, that market's going to loosen up a lot because there's a lot of new liquefied natural gas capacity coming online around the world, not just in the U.S., but in Australia and Canada, potentially in East Africa, potentially in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, other sources of supply. So when you look out, not in this crisis, but maybe in the next one, a few years down the road, again, toward the end of the decade, uh, the ability for a country like Russia to use natural gas as a weapon, I think, uh, can be diminished if we have more diversity of supply, more competition, and more liquidity in the global natural gas market. And I think that U.S. exports of natural gas will help contribute to that. The debate we've had so far to date in the U.S. about whether we should approve the export of natural gas has been largely around whether it'll push up gas prices in the U.S., whether it's going to adversely impact the 
uh, manufacturing or petrochemical industry. We haven't talked as much as I think we probably should about what the geopolitical implications of putting U.S. gas into the global market might be, and I think this crisis is one reminder of the benefits that we can see if the U.S. Uh, increases diversity of supply by putting uh, U.S. natural gas into the global market. There are other things that the U.S. can do as well some in the nearer term, some in the longer term. Uh, in the near term, you know, if there was a cutoff of supply, uh, obviously prices would go up uh, dramatically. The Ukraine would face severe uh, challenges. We're already going to see prices go up starting April 1st. They've announced that the price discount uh, they were getting before is going to be repealed, so prices will go up uh, to a little bit above what kind of the EU uh, average is. And so, as you saw from Jan's slides, the Ukrainian economy is already under severe pressure, and so this higher energy price will uh, put them under even more pressure, and I think the U.S. and the EU need to provide support and financial assistance to help them uh, weather this if they actually saw the supplies cut off entirely. Their options really are limited now, though there are some things uh, that might be done in the near to medium term. Uh, there's some pipeline capacity from Hungary uh, and from Poland that, you know, is not overnight, but maybe with a little bit of lead time, you can bring a little bit more supply in by reversing some things. There's more pipeline capacity from Slovakia, but again, it takes a little bit of time to try to reverse some pipelines. But I think policy officials in the U.S. and EU can be working with industry to think about how to uh, make sure that those steps are available if uh, necessary. Um, and then uh, there may also be the ability to get some electricity from other parts of the EU, so they actually reduce the need to generate their own electricity, which would reduce the need for fuel in the Ukraine. Looking out in the longer term, you put U.S. natural gas into the global market. Uh, energy efficiency, actually we can help Ukraine be much more energy efficient. Uh, Japan's economy is about five times as energy efficient as Ukraine's. They waste a lot of energy, particularly in their industrial sector. And they have the third largest shale gas reserves in Europe after uh, Poland and <coughs> France. And and uh, we uh, work having U.S. companies and U.S. government, you know, share technology and expertise uh, about what experience we've had with shale gas development in the U.S., how to make sure it happens safely and economically through technical assistance, I think is something we can do uh, to try to help them develop their own energy resources along with renewable energy resources looking out. But again, these are sort of not for today's crisis, but uh, for the next one. So I think that's sort of how to think about the role that natural gas can play and is playing both today and then also thinking about how to make uh, EU and Ukraine more energy secure looking out toward the next several years. Great. Uh, I think American rhetoric, uh, as it sometimes does in crises, has been running ahead of American strategy. Uh, there's plenty of huffing and puffing about Ukrainian sovereignty and Russian overreach, uh, but I think so far uh, only hesitant and modest actions to exert real leverage. Uh, and this is because although Moscow has gone too far and uh, will suffer to one degree or another for it, uh, Russian political and social interests in Ukraine are greater than uh, the USA's. And the political and social interests may outweigh the potentially severe economic and diplomatic costs uh, that it pays for them. Uh, so far, there's no evidence uh, that Washington intends to pay a high price to contest Russian action. Uh, no evidence that American public opinion wants to do so. Uh, so the odds are that uh, U.S. and European counteraction will be substantial, but more symbolic than decisive. Uh, in American foreign policy debate, uh, Russian action can be seen roughly in, in two opposite ways. Uh, for Hawks, uh, it shows that Ukraine should have been taken into NATO earlier to deter Moscow from using force there or anywhere in the former Soviet Union. The mistake was leaving NATO expansion incomplete. Uh, although the Soviet Union and communism are gone, Russia requires an, uh, excuse me, remains an enemy uh, and a potent geopolitical force that uh, has to be countered, uh, so a new Cold War. For doves, uh, it shows that the chickens are coming home to roost. Uh, NATO expansion created a dangerous provocation to Moscow, which was less obvious in the 1990s, only because Russia then was crippled and weak. Uh, but uh, it's now triggered by the revolution in Kiev uh, when it's clear that the West has no stomach for serious conflict with Russia. Uh, the mistake was in NATO expansion at all. Uh, Russia is far weaker than the old USSR, and it has no casus belli apart from maintaining a sphere of influence uh, and status as a major power, and NATO's refusal to accommodate that eventually proved counterproductive. 
Uh, I incline toward the second view, <clears throat> but it's less popular by far than the first. Uh, I think despite the drift to retrenchment in the recent uh, few years, uh, post-Cold War consensus of sorts remains. Uh, and it's built on a coalition of strange bedfellows, neoconservatives and paleoliberals, uh, both of whom support in one form or another an American mission to lead the world toward a Wilsonian vision. Uh, the difference, it seems to me, being that neocons are willing to pay the price in blood and treasure, uh, and liberals not, uh, thinking we can do it without great sacrifice. Uh, this means we've so far uh, seen mostly symbolic posturing by the Obama administration and risky recommendations for military movements by right-wing hawks. Uh, consensus for activism is still strong within the foreign policy elite, but not the mass public. But the mass public is still uh, pretty much uninterested in foreign policy in general, uh, so it exerts less restraint than it might uh, or than it would uh, if something becomes a true crisis that is raising the, uh, the danger of war. Uh, the situation in Ukraine, of course, is too complex uh, to warrant either the simple hawkish or dovish judgments I've capsulized. Uh, but the complexity of the crisis and its origins and options uh, isn't likely to play much uh, in political debate at high levels inside the Washington Beltway. Uh, complexity in the sense of consideration such as that uh, Crimea was historically part of Russia until 1954 or Western complicity in similar support of secession, Kosovo case, and earlier acquiescence in similar Russian action in Georgia in 2008, or the heterogeneity of revolutionary elements in Western Ukraine, including nationalists threatening to Russians. Uh, the EU role in precipitating the crisis, uh, perhaps by forcing a choice between East and West or obstacles to effective buttressing of the revolutionary regime in Kiev. Uh, the desperate economic situation uh, in Ukraine, limited Western interest in a bailout, lack of decisive leverage against Russian annexation of Crimea, uh, and a clear uh, Western unwillingness to go to war uh, if Russia invades the rest of Ukraine. Uh, rather, in the United States uh, policy debate, uh, uh, it is, as most of American politics uh, is in the era of polarization and gridlock, uh, the, the issue is dominated by a blame game. So far, Republicans charging Obama with fecklessness and weakness, uh, ignoring the fact, uh, it seems to me, that Bush did even less to counter Russia and Georgia in 2008, and Democrats ignoring uh, the double standard question uh, in regard to Kosovo, which was the secession uh, engineered by Bill Clinton. Uh, and all on both sides fulminating while obviously unwilling to challenge Russian action in a serious way. Uh, worse uh, to me is the natural impulse to claim a vigorous response uh, producing some foolish gestures like trumpeting the dispatch of F-15s to Poland or ships to the Black Sea. To me this uh, seems too reminiscent uh, of sending the uh, carrier enterprise to the Bay of Bengal and in the uh, Indo-Pakistani War of 1971. Uh, it appears both insulting and incredible at the same time. Uh, so either heralded military deployments like this uh, are supposed to signal willingness to fight, uh, in which case they're reckless in regard to Ukraine, or they don't, in which case they look silly. Uh, now, genuine military response would be stationing American or other allied forces in Poland and Estonia as a deterrent, all of the Cold War uh, deployment of uh, forces in West Germany. Uh, but there's no talk of that except on the fringe because it's obviously provocative, escalatory, and dangerous uh, for reasons Western countries should have thought of when they expended NATO membership in the first place, in my view. Uh, now, if Russia invades Ukraine proper, though, uh, uh, that's all off. Uh, NATO reinforcement of its vulnerable uh, new members becomes almost inevitable. Uh, and this will be the biggest reversion to the Cold War and potentially uh, the most delicate and, and dangerous in terms of crisis management. Uh, as for 
the credibility of counteraction, it seems to me the test will be the intensity of Western non-military penalties, uh, which are less dangerous. Uh, evidence of serious non-military response would be in some form or other, uh, for example, not canceling the G8 meeting, but rescheduling the venue and excluding Russia. Uh, economic sanctions against Moscow that really bite and that thus are costly to European interests in trade and investment. Crash program of some sort to replace Russian gas supplies to Ukraine and Europe. Uh, I haven't heard, uh, at least out, being outside the Beltway, I haven't heard noises about going to such lengths. Uh, if the West is not going to pay such prices, one might argue that it should stop yapping about the unacceptability of Russian action, uh, since it only makes us look impotent and phony, and instead concentrate on uh, compromises with Moscow that might offer some form of face-saving concession to induce uh, backing off. The danger may not have peaked uh, for reasons, for example, that Peter was talking about. Uh, it seems to me that Russia has the advantage, and if it presses, uh, could trigger escalation as the West makes limited responses met by Russia upping the ante uh, and the situation in some sense spiraling out of control. I don't think that's likely, uh, but the probability isn't trivial. Potential precipitants of escalation, for example, chaos in eastern Ukraine, uh, instability in Estonia, uh, Russian tit-for-tat matching of symbolic NATO military actions provoking intensified Western military movements, uh, economic warfare. Uh, there are a lot of shoes that uh, have not uh, perhaps fallen yet. The alternative uh, would be some sort of deal that lets Russia off the hook in exchange for foregoing annexation of Crimea. For example, hypothetically, assurances of greater local autonomy for uh, Russians within Ukraine assurance of Russian citizen status, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the assurance of greater autonomy for Crimea within Ukraine, and the assurance of Russian citizen status within Ukraine proper, for example, restored recognition of uh, Russia as one, of, Russian as one of the official languages. Uh, assurance that Ukraine will not be in NATO or the EU. Uh, Ukrainian military neutrality and balanced Ukrainian economic relations uh, with the EU and Russia. Uh, and Russian concession of some sort on gas supplies, uh, whether that be a renewed discount or delay in payment demands or something that eased the uh, squeeze. But I doubt that American politicians will accept such apparently imbalanced concessions to Moscow. Uh, my best estimate is uh, long-term damage to the post-Cold War project of consolidating peace in Europe, unless Russia backs down from annexing Crimea. And perhaps why should it, given the balance of interests and cards that it holds? Uh, unless it backs down, the situation of cold peace we've had degenerates into a revived mini-Cold War. Russia will have half reasserted its sphere of influence after NATO had half truncated it. Uh, the prospects for restarting Russian democratization will be even dimmer than they were, and thus prospects for eventual integration of Russia uh, in the West will dim further as well. Uh, in the annals of international politics, this seems to me one of those true tragedies, uh, a lose-lose situation for all sides. But I'm not an expert on the region, as uh, the other panelists are, and I defer to them. And as my students uh, know, I've told them uh, I'm a pessimist by nature, so I always hope to be proved wrong. I promised you a diversity of views on a range of subjects, and I think that, uh, I think that our panel has really delivered. Um, just in case you haven't got enough, uh, uh, views on this topic. I want to re recommend uh, The Monkey Cage on the Washington Post has had a number of, I think, really insightful articles on the Ukrainian uh, crisis by you know, scholars who've been studying the region for a very long time with very interesting survey data. Um, 
and I really recommend it uh, uh, to everyone to read. Also, I'll put my, my Harriman uh, hat on and say, if you didn't get enough today, tomorrow Andranik Migranyan, who is a former member of the public chamber and the head of the uh, public chamber of the Russian Federation and uh, uh, a longtime foreign policy sage in Russia, and who's now directs the Institute for Democ Democracy and Cooperation in Europe, um, uh, a democracy and cooperation who's based here in New York and will give a, 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 a likely give a line that's much closer to um, the Russian perspective. And then on Wednesday, we have uh, Paula Dobriansky, um, who's the former Undersecretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs, um, who I imagine will give a view of events much closer to uh, what, the, what, what it looks like from Washington. And she's now a fellow at, at Harvard University. So there's a lot going on uh, this week. And both those talks are at noon. Um, we are videotaping today. So uh, your participation implies your consent. Uh, if you uh, have a question, uh, please raise your hand, and we'll bring the microphone around. And I can't stress this enough. Uh, please be brief in your questions. Uh, I feel very comfortable cutting you off uh, if I think that you're going on for, for too long. Um, and uh, uh, please, questions, not uh, questions disguised in the form uh, uh, of a comment. Does and if you could just say who you are and- Does that apply to our responses too? Pardon? Does that apply to our responses too? Uh, yeah, counsel? why not? <laughs> uh, um, uh, and if you just say who you are and you know, any institutional affiliation that you have uh, when you start. There's a microphone in the back of the room. Do you want to start? Okay. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Edmund Reiter. I was born in Ukraine, but I am an American now, and I am interested in Americans' interests. I, I organized while teaching in Queens exactly 50 years ago, 1964, the All New York City Committee to protest the growing war in Vietnam. My question is addressed to all members of the panel. Is Obama an idealist <laughs> like President Wilson, or do we have great national interests in the conflict with Russia? The question is, what are these interests? And secondly, since our greatest competitor is China, mm -hmm. is the, our conflict with Russia worth in further propelling United States into the enthusiast enthusiastically a arms of China? Okay. Dick, do you want to start on that? You're our okay. foreign uh, policy guru. I'll put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> I would say uh, that Obama, like most politicians, is both all of the above, depending on the context uh, uh, and the moment. Uh, as to American interests in Ukraine, personally, I would see those interests as primarily uh, peace and stability, meaning consolidating the post-Cold War peace in Europe and avoiding uh, the sort of crisis that we're in right now. Uh, so I would personally put those interests above uh, the uh, interests of Ukrainians themselves, which would be in uh, not only peace and stability, but justice and uh, what is good for children and other living things and American ideals. Although I would hope that we could get both without having to choose. On China, I think you raise an important issue. And, uh, I, I'm not sure what experts in China have seen in recent days, uh, but in some respects, China opposes Russian action in Ukraine because of the uh, implicit <coughs> lesson for secession in dissident areas uh, uh, like uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. But in other ways, um, the West has, it seems to me, been providing incentives for Russia and China to overcome uh, their own intense disagreements or suspicions or animosities uh, to make common cause against Western pressure. And in that sense, uh, this latest crisis, coupled with the trends we've seen in the last uh, 
two to three years in Asia uh, intensify those incentives, whether they will make enough difference to propel China and Russia into a, a real uh, alliance of sorts, which most people would write off as fanciful uh, otherwise. I don't know, but uh, it seems to me we've provided incentives in that direction. David, uh, Phillips over here. My name is David Phillips. I head the program on peace building and human rights here at Columbia. And my question concerns the transatlantic response. How would you characterize Europe's reaction so far? And if, in fact, there are going to be any kind of biting sanctions, uh, could you identify areas where the US and European powers can work together? Or is there any low-hanging fruit that you foresee? And what's the likely response in the EU to an action in Crimea? Anyone? Peter? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I guess to echo what Dick just said, I think uh, part of the answer depends on who you're reading. Uh, I know. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Part of the answer depends on who you're reading. I, I know a lot of the pundits are saying the Europeans are be, being especially feckless. They're not prepared to engage in any kind of real sanctions with teeth that Dick was just talking about. Uh, they're doing a lot of consulting and talking and talking to Putin, but nobody seems prepared to do a whole lot more beyond that. I mean, that's just my superficial take. Um, I'm happy to defer to others watching this. As a European, do you have any? Uh, sure. Sure. <laughs> No, I, th I think I think I agree with what's uh, appearing here as the uh, majority view. I think uh, Europeans would like to um, do something, but uh, are in a position economically where they uh, realize they don't have uh, much latitude. Uh, I think the U.S. Uh, uh, historically has um, pursued its self-interest, which it should, and uh, would intervene uh, strongly where that self-interest is uh, harmed or where it has clear uh, contractual uh, treaty type uh, obligations which here it does not so uh, so I think that the result is a relatively you know it's going to be visible but not very powerful uh, response unfortunately uh, and uh, and I think you know there's some evolution of it and I think it's also because Putin acts very resolutely here and uh, and I think he is indicating just just like the Soviet Union that uh, he respects power, and the power is not forthcoming here in the opposite direction. So I, I'm, that's why I said I'm somewhat pessimistic in this case, although generally I'm an optimist. I guess I would, I would put, just to get things uh, going even stronger, I would pose a question here. Suppose in one of the countries where there is strong Russian population, so that was Estonia and Latvia, right? Um, suppose the conflict between local population, Russian population flared up. And suppose uh, Russian troops move in a couple of miles in, stopped and said, you know, absolutely no further action. We just needed to handle the conflict here. Would NATO invoke uh, the need to respond? Uh, would it not? You can ignore it. But can I add <laughs> A quick, a quick point on the European reaction. I, I had the opportunity last week to hear um, someone from Germany who was commenting about the challenges facing Merkel. And it's not just that they have important economic equities. The person made the point that uh, Merkel has the other difficulty of trying to manage anything that has to do with helping the United States right now. <laughs> that public sentiment right now as a result of the Snowden case in Germany is actually quite palpable. And that to suddenly go out of our way in Germany to kind of assist the Americans, despite what's going on in Crimea, for something that we're leading the charge on, if it's to say something really hard-nosed, I think there'd be a little bit of, he was saying, there's some soul searching that would occur because people are so angry right now. They're, they're not absolutely inclined right now to go along with whatever the United States asks people to do. On top of Germans' historical role in Eastern Europe, Europe, which is also well, another complicated. Factor, yeah. so. I think the question about Estonia or Latvia is a very important one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if the sort of scenario that uh, was, was just mentioned occurred, I, I think it would probably be the end of NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it seems to me when Estonia was admitted to NATO, uh, the people who did it uh, were not really thinking about NATO's original purpose. NATO in the post-Cold War era was transformed from primarily a military alliance into primarily a political club. And the idea that admitting Estonia meant that if uh, Russia came to rescue its oppressed fraternal brethren in <coughs> Estonia, we would have to go to war with Russia, uh, just wasn't part of the calculation. Uh, and I'm sure to some experts it was, but to me, uh, uh, I think that was just considered old thinking, uh, that uh, anybody who brought that up was uh, mired in the, uh, the, the blinkered, uh, uh, terms of, of the Cold War and, and didn't understand that everything was different uh, in, in the new era. Uh, but we're stuck with that now. Uh, NATO, uh, Estonia is in NATO, uh, for better or worse. Uh, and that's why uh, one of the potentially dangerous escalatory uh, actions that could occur that I mentioned would be the felt need to do something more to reinforce NATO's commitment to Estonia uh, if the current crisis worsens, uh, and that could take on a life of its own. I want to make one point here. Um, a kind of intermediate case is the Eastern Ukrainian case, yes. uh, which sits, sits between uh, Crimea, where there's a strong attachment to a regional identity, and the uh, Estonian and, 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 and uh, uh, Latvian case, where we have this overlapping uh, uh, diaspora communities. Um, there's an, uh, a nice piece in this uh, Washington Post monkey cage by Ralph Clem, who reminds us that Russian speaking does not mean uh, necessarily mean pro-Russian. Uh, he shows in the 2001 census in Ukraine, which is the most recent one, uh, that 66% uh, uh, of uh, Eastern Ukrainians identify as Ukrainians. So the plurality in most districts are uh, identify as Ukrainians, even though in lots of places Russian speakers make up uh, the majority. Now that's uh, you know a data point at one point in time, but what often happens in these situations, as as uh, Peter Clement pointed out, is people are forced to make choices. Right. So we have this basically dual language. You know, Russian and Ukrainian are not that. Uh, far apart, although I don't speak Ukrainian, so I, can, I shouldn't speak authoritatively on the point. But you do have television programs that switch back and forth between Ukrainian uh, and Russian. And uh, uh, when people are forced to make a choice, that kind of uh, uh, easy coexistence of identities uh, can really be um, uh, uh, limited. And you force people to make choices, and it can really change uh, uh, the dynamics. So. Uh, Andrew, you had one there, and then there's, in the back, there's a, a, a woman uh, who, who we'll go to next, okay? Uh, my name is Lucia Cannon, I'm alumni of Columbia, and I wanted to, uh, to ask a question of Professor Betts, and uh, essentially to ask him to clarify this concept of spheres of influence, because uh, I had an impression that this was sort of an idea that uh, went out with World War II or, or the Cold War, and uh, you know we had Hitler and Stalin endorsing spheres of influence, and now to have especially American liberals talking about spheres, inf spheres of influence, when I thought this was an idea that was sort of superseded by idea that countries have a right to choose their own I internal organization and their own affiliations. Well, there's a disagreement about whether the idea of spheres of influence is a relic of uh, the 19th century or not, uh, and there are debates about this. Uh, but the argument uh, in favor of recognizing the reality of spheres of influence is that historically this has uh, been what great powers have had uh, for various reasons, sometimes aggressive, sometimes defensive. Uh, the United States assumes its sphere of influence absolutely within the Western Hemisphere. We take it for granted even in the 21st century. Uh, and uh, it seems to me in this context the question was, after the Cold War, whether Russia was permanently debased as uh, a basket case among nations, or was uh, a major power uh, that was uh, in trouble but would be back. Uh, and it seems to me it is back. Uh, and uh, if it doesn't have a sphere of influence, uh, then it has reason to fear uh, being surrounded. Uh, 
uh, and indeed, uh, if it has uh, NATO not only on its doorstep uh, in Europe, but incorporating parts of the old Soviet Union, and if China remains hostile uh, in the East, uh, uh, it has reason to not be very cooperative. Uh, so the argument in favor of recognizing a sphere of influence would be in favor of accepting Russia as still a major power uh, and hoping that uh, it would be part of a stabilizing modus vivendi between the West and, and Russia. Andrew in the back. <clears throat> My name is Ksenia. I'm a teacher's college uh, student, um, applied physiology major. Um, I grew up uh, in Soviet Union and then newly formed Ukraine. And uh, my question stems towards the gross uh, misinformation of American and the world public by the news networks, specifically by what's happening in Krim. Um, I refuse to call it Crimea because Krim is the correct political name. And uh, what actually coming from the ground is that situation is extremely stable. Russian forces are there. There's a tense standoff, but it's very stable. Um, banks are working, shops are working, people are going to work who actually works. But it's an economic decision on um, citizens of Krim um, mines, because most of them are unemployed. They go to Russia for work, and visa recent uh, visa regime, they can only work for three months, then they have to stay uh, in Ukraine for three months, and then go back again. There's literally no money in Krim. So if anything happens, this is where it will be coming from. And um, the question is towards what is going to be done towards the media who actually exaggerate the situation and um, literally make it worse for anybody to make actually the correct opinion on what is going on. Do you want to take that? <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> you raised a very interesting question. Well, first of all, uh, speaking about the stability in the Crimea, um, I think it's, it's too far-fetched. There are armed people on both sides, and thanks God there was no shots fired up till now. So this just looks as stable. It's very uh, volatile and very dangerous, as a matter of fact. The second part of your question about the misinformation, well, <clears throat> I think this, uh, specifically as far as Crimea is concerned and what's going on now, or, but this issue of misinformation or brainwashing the, let's say, population in Crimea, this was a, a you know, policy of uh, Russia for decades. In fact, because the uh, Ukrainian government has not paid the necessary attention to Crimea. And in, in the face of this uh, ever-growing influence of, uh, of Russia in Crimea, practically, uh, Crimea, to a degree, was lost. Well, you know that there are higher uh, institutions of higher learning for the citizens, for young citizens of Crimea, free of charge. There were these uh, issuing of visas to anyone, Russian Federation visas to anyone who wanted or who was asked to do it. Uh, so, and look at what's going on now. Uh, you don't have to go far, uh, switch uh, Russia today. And you will see the information from the correspondence from Crimea speaking about these attacks, constant attacks on peaceful uh, citizens of Russian origin by these banderites, by these radicals. Well, th there is no proof of that. On the contrary, the attacks are made by those, uh, well, this is the minority, but they are very belligerent and they are attacking really peaceful citizen and the people in Crimea are really frightened 
you see, really, the, 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 the ordinary people. Well, <clears throat> so the issue is that uh, the information should be more balanced. Well, I would say from both sides, but specifically <coughs> the information that is furnished by the Russian official mass media. Thank you. Okay. Actually, no, 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 Andrew, can you bring up your question? Thanks. Yeah, right here. My name is Elena Lipkova um, with RTO Global Investors. Um, the question is the following. Uh, the referendum goes through, it seems, a foregone co conclusion. The results of referendum foregone conclusion. What's next? Russia annexes uh, Crimea. And what is the next? Because as Professor Betts said, West is not going to, uh, will have only a limited response. So what is, what is the ultimate objective uh, following, Ukraine, for, following Crimea? Is it Eastern Ukraine? It, wouldn't, it would be very nice because the pipeline goes through that. So if majority of Russian population coincides with the pipeline, then it's an easy double-edged double -edged sword and double-edged solution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Peter, do you want to take that one? Well, I, I agree. I think the referendum is an important turning point. It's, it's a fork in the road. If Putin stops there, then it could be that he just wanted to take back Crimea, which they thought was always there. But if they go beyond that and you see continued agitation in other parts of eastern Ukraine, then I think it's much more dangerous. I don't think the population is as homogeneous, say, as it is in, in Crim, Crimea. Yeah. Uh, that it's a little more heterogeneous. I'm guessing there's a lot of intermarriage. I think the same issue that I've heard here from several speakers, I don't know that people identify themselves as Russian in the sense of Russian citizens, even though they speak Russian. If they do that, then I think we have, a, we have the bigger problem, that in fact Putin's designs are much greater. It's not just a bargaining chip. It's not just taking back Crimea because it always belonged to us. It's something else. Then I think on the NATO side, for example, I think people would actually ask for some kind of a physical presence in the Baltic states and Poland and say, we, since we have no idea where Putin's really going, we can't take a chance anymore. We need to fortify ourselves and make it clear, don't even think about doing anything else. But I think then we're in a real big crisis if they were to go beyond the borders of Crimea. Mm -hmm. one, other, one other point is uh, it changes the voting balance a lot in uh, Ukraine, the most exactly. loyal uh, voting bloc for uh, pro-Russian candidates and parties has been Crimea. So if you take that away, uh, then you really weaken the power at the polls of the pro-Russian uh, politicians. So the Western Ukraine, which you know votes as a bloc, and Eastern Ukraine, um, uh, uh, you know, is a little bit more heterogeneous. So. Going forward, it could change uh, uh, voting patterns. So there, there are costs and benefits here to you know, taking Crimea back uh, uh, to Russia. So, and there is no room for military um, steps from Russia. They will try to cover it up, but it's correct. Right? I don't think anyone's saying that. I think that all options are on the on the table. I think Peter mentioned that uh, it's not clear where things are going to go. Who, who, who's not? Can you? Uh, so much, right there. Thank you. Yes, uh... Hello. Uh, uh, could you guys maybe just speak uh, a little bit on uh, Turkey's role uh, in all this? Uh, I think that maybe we've got energy, know. we've got national security, we've got Ukraine. We don't have a Turkish expert <laughs> on here, but uh, can anybody say a, a few few words? Uh, uh, I don't have any insights on, on that. Well, they are a member of NATO, but I have not seen a whole lot of media. But on the other hand, I haven't looked that closely. Um, I probably want some time to look at that. <laughs> They've got their hands full with Syria and some other yeah. things. Yeah, and internal crisis at home as well. Yes. So, uh, Dad, do you want to go right here, Andrew? Thanks. My name is Peter Sturm. I'm a New York tourist from Europe. And my question comes back to something Richard Betts mentioned, namely uh, the secession of Kosovo from Serbia. And I would like uh, Mr. Betts, but also the rest of the panel, what are the similarities and what are the differences between the secession of Kosovo from Serbia compared with what is going on in the Crimean at the moment 
and how do these differences or similarities explain the completely different attitude of the Western powers and NATO to these two developments? Okay. I'm glad that uh, in all of the things that you could be doing in New York, <laughs> that you've decided to spend your afternoon here with us today. I think that speaks to the, the power of this panel. So, uh, Very impressed. I think the main, <clears throat> the main similarity is that it was an intervention uh, by uh, foreign powers uh, to enable de facto and ultimately, in, in view of the West legal, but years later, secession of a province uh, from Yugoslavia uh, as the Russian intervention engineers the secession of Crimea from Ukraine. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that they're analogous uh, situations or that what NATO did was as bad as what Russia did or not, but there is that similarity. Uh, it was the case of uh, uh, ethnic diversity and imbalanced populations and disagreements between uh, uh, parts of what had been a unified country uh, leading to that uh, sort of a separation. Uh, the, the differences, uh, uh, of course, uh, NATO didn't immediately declare secession. NATO, uh, Western Europe and the United States did not annex Kosovo. They uh, made it independent, uh, which is quite different from annexing Crimea. Uh, those would seem to me the main or most salient similarities uh, and differences. I, I would say, uh, though, that uh, you know most political discussion is not going to dwell on the nuances and fine points of the distinctions. And even raising the uh, point that there are similarities between what uh, NATO did in Kosovo and what Russia did in Crimea would be extremely inflammatory <coughs> in American politics and would probably on balance be denounced uh, as uh, uh, inaccurate and uh, unhelpful. But uh, it seems to me the limited similarities that there are have some relevance to the, uh, the debate about uh, uh, international norms and how they apply. Andrew, can you come here? Thanks. I'm trying to get to everybody, but we're, we're, we're not going to have time. So if you can keep your questions uh, brief, that's better. Roman Kizik, uh, senior, uh, senior advisor to Myrmidon Group. Uh, Professor Fry, I'd like to build on the comment you made about the uh, Clem monkey cage piece. The uh, this 2001 census indicated 61%. 60, uh, more recently, um, the Rzumkov Center uh, uh, did a survey of the youth that participated in Maidan in uh, uh, Independence Square. And in fact, the statistics are that um, the youth that were out on Maidan were all born after independence. And the numbers of Russian-speaking Eastern Ukrainian youth identify themselves as 73% Ukrainian. And so the Razumkov study is quite significant. Um, <clears throat> I would also like to build on the comment that Ksenia made back there. I have recently come back from Maidan, from Kyiv, where I spent 10 days. It's pretty stable. I mean, I know there were horrible incidents, and media tends to focus on bloodshed and killing. Um, there's also hyperbole for older generations, specifically uh, the anti-Semite, Banderite fascist anti-Semite piece. But Ksenia, you're right, people go to work. One of the great YouTube videos that's out is on th uh, Thursday evening, March 4th. Um, there was a team that went out and filmed uh, the Zberskaya Street, which is the main drag in Odessa, and they said, where are the red and black flag anti-Semite banderites? And people are walking around, they're having drinks, they're going to McDonald's. It's just not there. Thank you. Okay, maybe we didn't get a question out of that, but uh, <laughs> useful information. Uh, my name is Viktor Baranchaka. I'm Energy Advisor, President Council on World Affairs, Houston, New York City. I'm also a former member of the Ukrainian government. I'd like to direct my questions probably to Jan. Um, the Ukrainian debts uh, that uh, is held Russian bankers right now, it's approximately $30 billion. So uh, Russia is uh, the primary creditor in Ukraine. At the same time, a uh, general value economic relationship between Russia and EU to be estimated approximately half trillion euro per year. 
how is your predictions about EU sanctions? Thank you. It's a, you know, it's, it's a, com it's a complicated uh, situation. So I would first of all say that uh, how debt is treated <clears throat> varies dramatically across countries and how, uh, yeah, close. And, um, and how the international financial community treats those who don't repay the debt is also very interesting. So if you're Argentina and uh, you don't, you renege, uh, the punishment is swift and major. Uh, the Poles renegotiated after 1990 and uh, were not in any way uh, ostracized. Um, the Russians, uh, 98, uh, decided not to pay and were admitted to the world financial markets uh, relatively quickly after that. So it all depends, uh, you know, Ukraine could, um, you know, pay the debt and uh, set aside a significant part of GDP every year to, uh, to um, uh, service the debt. Um, that's assuming it doesn't get the forgiving of it by, by the Russians, and obviously that's going to be a big bargaining chips, but uh, the financial community and Western governments could have a significant say over what kind of uh, punishment, if any, there would be for not paying it. And as you're pointing out, the ongoing uh, year after year worth of the relationship with the largest economic bloc in the world, namely the European Union, is worth a lot. So that obviously is uh, something that has a very positive effect uh, that Ukraine could exploit. And this is where the Western uh, countries, uh, led by the EU, could have a significant positive leverage. It doesn't cost them that much, really, to uh, make Ukraine be a preferred member of the economic uh, club, economic no, community. I would say one thing going forward as well is uh, the, the Russian economy is slowing. Uh, growth was a little over 1% this year. Uh, estimates are, prior to the crisis, it would be a little over 1%, maybe 2% uh, uh, going forward. And, but beyond the numbers, I think that there's a real sense of unease um, about whether or not the uh, current government has the, the, the capacity and a plan for developing the economy. So that beyond the numbers, I think that if you look at indicators like business confidence, um, which should be a lot higher than it is, people are very pessimistic as capital flight is still flying uh, out of Russia. So. Uh, all this goes to say that uh, Europe needs Russian gas and Russia needs European euros. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that this trade relationship works both ways. Uh, and, and since the uh, export of natural resources plays such a big part in the Russian budget and a growing part uh, in the Russian budget, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the depiction is often, I think, uh, uh, overly one-sided about the, the economic relationship between Russia and, uh, and the EU. Andrew, do you want to, this gentleman here? Dan Vitvitsky, I served as a resident legal advisor at our embassy in Kiev in the late 2000s. Uh, the first question is either to Professor Betts or, or Professor Fry. What are our obligations under the Budapest Memorandum? I mean, that was mentioned briefly uh, in passing, but uh, Ukraine gave up its nukes uh, in uh, return for guarantees of its territorial integrity. What are our obligations? A second question is to, uh, to, to Peter and anyone else, is uh, to what extent is it possible that Ukraine is the canary in the coal mine? Uh, I don't know whether anybody reads Alexander Dugin's uh, blog uh, the chap who's, who's identified as, as being Putin's chief ideologist, but two days ago or three days ago, I don't remember exactly, he wrote a long letter, open letter to Americans uh, that, he was, that, he, that he or one of his people was, was kind enough to translate into English because I don't read Russian. Uh, and what, one of the things he's talking about is a Eurasian unit, union, uh, not from Odessa to Moscow or from Kiev to Moscow, but from Lisbon to Vladivostok. Okay. Now, I know that back in the early 30s, uh, you know, nobody took Mein Kampf seriously. But uh, all jokes aside, uh, is anybody paying attention? And should be. Okay. Well, as to whether it's canary in the coal mine, I think that's an important question, several uh, dimensions. Uh, and it, it makes a lot of the details of how the current crisis is, if not resolved, at least handled. Uh, over uh, time, crucial. Uh, 
what's in Putin's mind, how that might change if he perceives great success or disappointment. Uh, I, I think uh, Peter or Tim are in a better position to, uh, to guess than I am. On the obligations to Ukraine, uh, I think uh, if you're talking about obligations to defend Ukraine, uh, they may be a little bit ahead of our obligations under the Kellogg-Briand Pact, but not far. Um, Stephen Pfeiffer, and I don't know whether you know him, he, he was the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine at the time of the signing. He wrote a very lengthy op-ed piece last week, which was very good. He said one of the biggest issues they debated in that discussion on the wording in the treaty was whether to use the word guarantee versus assurances. And the guarantee was a security guarantee, which sounds a lot like Article 5 NATO. We guarantee your security. <laughs> as opposed to assurances. And he said the people who argued for assurances won the debate. And the nuance was, it's not exactly a guarantee. So I guess I'm a little closer to Kellogg Breon than I am to <laughs> Article 5, unfortunately for the Ukrainians. On the issue of Dugan, I can assure you, people do. People where I work read him uh, pretty closely. And I, I'm certainly aware of his, his writings. To be honest, I have not seen the open letter to the US yet. Um, I would not ignore him. I don't know that that's the predominant strain in Putin's thinking, but as I suggested in my comments, I'm fairly open-minded. I, I need to see what happens in Ukraine. If we see a lot of agitation in other places in the East, but even beyond that, then I think maybe, maybe you've got some basis for arguing that maybe Dugan has an undue influence on Putin's thinking. Remains to be seen. <coughs> Could I just add one last point to this? I mean, this raises the question, too, of a new Cold War. And I think it's important to remember, especially for younger people who don't remember the old Cold War, that if there's a new Cold War, it will be radically different in terms of the position that the West holds, radically different in terms of the balance of power and in our favor, uh, far more than it was during uh, the old Cold War. <coughs> May I add a few words to that issue? It's very controversial. First of all, as was rightly mentioned, the memorandum speaks about assurances. As a matter of fact, at the time in 1994, I worked as minister counsel in our embassy in Washington, and we worked closely with Stephen Pfeiffer, who was that at that time on the Ukrainian desk. Uh, and I was involved in, in these issues of Ukraine's nuclear disarmament. So, the Ukrainian side was insisting that the document that will be signed uh, in, uh, will have legally binding, uh, let's say, provisions. In other words, the Ukrainian side insisted that they would get guarantees, which the Western partners were not ready to comply with. So the formula was found that the assurances would be given they amount to recognizing sovereignty, territorial integrity, and inviolability of borders of Ukraine by the uh, five permanent members of the Security Council. And uh, similar assurances, if you go deeper, are given to any country member of a non-PT treaty, non-proliferation treaty. Ukraine signed this treaty. but. It was a, an achievement at the time. Ukraine needed some sort of, uh, you know, achievement even for the internal consumption because there were not everyone was in favor of getting rid of nuclear weapons from Ukraine, sterilely, specifically the tactical nuclear weapons. So this uh, memorandum is more like a declaration. It's a, the assurances are not legally binding on the parties who signed the document. Thank you. I think one more question, if we can, Andrew. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Victoria Kupchanetsky. I'm a correspondent for Voice of America Russian Service. My question is for Mr. Clement and Mr. Betts, professors. Um, uh, uh, President Putin has this theory that since the um, uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, the West and the United States and the European Union and the State Department and the CIA have been trying to undermine the power of Russia. 
and even have been working towards um, uh, uh, towards making it uh, lesser in terms of its territory. He believes that uh, CIA and the State Department and the U.S. Uh, 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 were supporting these insurgency movements in uh, in the North Caucasus. Uh, Putin believes that he was lied to because uh, he was promised that NATO would never expand and now it's been expanding. Now he believes that uh, the Ukrainian revolution has gone too far because uh, he thinks that uh, the, uh, the people who have come to power in the Ukraine, they are too, uh, way too anti-Russian. And in fact, Mr. Yarosh, who is the head of the um, uh, right front, um, uh, who is now is, uh, is uh, going to run for presidency. He's, uh, he's uh, mentioned this many times that his struggle, the essence of his struggle is to actually fight the Russian empire and, and um, uh, Russian expansion. So um, uh, is this just a conspiracy theory that he is entertaining? Is, is this his paranoia? Or do you think that his conspiracy theory vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, the West has some basis? To wrap up, that is a, that is a very good uh, That's a question. great question. I think a lot of people can weigh in on that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Dick, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I'd say it was not uh, on balance the intent of uh, the Western countries, but it was the effect uh, and could understandably from the other side of the divide be seen to be the intent. Uh, it seems to me that NATO expansion uh, followed from a coalition of uh, old anti-Russian hawks, but more significantly, a, a larger number of Western liberals who thought of balance of power thinking as old thinking, uh, as outmoded, uh, as primitive, uh, and that the post-Cold War world was one where balance of power didn't matter. Uh, and I think to a lot of the liberals in that coalition uh, that put over NATO expansion, uh, it was mainly an expansion of Western liberalism, helping to consolidate democratization uh, and the West, rather than uh, any intent to further debase Russia. Uh, but I think the effect of it, uh, in any case, uh, was consistent with the conspiracy theory. Um, I, I would agree with Dick, but, but I'd probably add to that. Um, I don't want to understate the importance of the Poles, the Balts in particular, there was a huge constituency for them getting into NATO. There's no question in my mind that for them, the security piece was very, very important. It wasn't just buying into the Western concept of democracy and transparency and Western values. For them, it really was, we don't even want to run any kind of chance whatsoever that what happened, say, in 1939 or earlier is ever going to happen again. Um, but the broader question about what Putin believes or doesn't believe, this is a big question. It, it, in part, it gets to the issue of how does Putin get his information? He's surrounded by like-minded people. From what I've been reading in the Western press, there was a piece in the Times, I think three days ago, which talked a bit about decision making. They said when Putin made this final decision on Crimea that he closeted himself with Nikolai Patrushev and Sergei Ivanov, probably two of the harder hardliners uh, among his inner circle of advisors. Um, and they probably, and I think they all are pretty much of the same mind. I, I think uh, Putin very much reflects kind of the KGB view of the world. There's a zero-sum mentality that he brings to the table when he sees the U.S. And I think it, it's also complicated. I think, uh, for example, after 9-11, Putin was one of the first, if not the first, to call uh, to express his horror, condolences, and support. He also had to uh, woo or win over his own hardline constituency on the issue of U.S. overflight rights uh, to Central Asia on our, on our way to Afghanistan. So I think early on in that relationship, I think I'd, I'd give Putin marks for at least trying to uh, strengthen that relationship. But then along the way, a lot of other things happened, <coughs> and, and not unusual. Uh, one would be the, uh, the U.S. move to withdraw from the ABM Treaty. I think that was a fairly significant moment for Putin and his thinking about the U.S. I think the NATO enlargement thing, particularly the entry of the Balts, and I think it was 2004, I think that probably solidified a suspicion about, well, you know, maybe this whole Cold War thing isn't exactly over. And it maybe it brought back a lot of his earlier career instincts, if you will. 
then I think he actually has bought into his own narrative. I think he is concerned domestically. He has a 61% approval rating. You know, in the U.S., that would be great. Uh, in Russia, it, it's actually the lowest it's been by a point uh, in the past year. Um, Putin's had really high ratings before that. I think after what happened in the streets in Moscow, when the streets suddenly showed up, uh, the rise of Mr. Navalny and other critics. Um, I think he's genuinely nervous that some event could spark something that would require serious uh, hard power to suppress. And it, to me, it speaks of an insecurity. And of course, in a system like that, where you try to control so much, that's probably not an unreasonable expectation that you're going to be a little nervous about everybody. I do think he believes that NGOs and American institutions helping to promote democracy and teach people how to run elections, in his view, is a subversive activity inside Russia. He's not alone, by the way. There are other states, if you look around, in autocratic regimes who don't really like Americans and NGOs. Um, and at the end of the day, he would argue, let's look at what happened in the world. Who went into Iraq? Who went into Libya? Who's egging everybody on in Syria? It's all about regime change in your favor. Course, we try to counter, you know, you know what happened in Egypt? Mm -hmm. That really wasn't our doing. Uh, we were very happy with, with the regime that worked in consonance with us in terms of issues like the Arab-Israeli peace process. But um, he saw us embrace change, and I think for him that's a fundamental issue. We tend to go with the flow. If there's change, we make our accommodation with it. He doesn't like change, particularly if it means regime change. So I think there's a lot on the U.S. behavior side that he sees as reinforcing his suspicions that we're out to uh, undermine his own position. Yeah, I may add very briefly, I have the impression that not only here, but in general, uh, yes, I have the impression that not only during this meeting, but in general, we are somehow idealizing Mr. Putin. And if I may say, uh, if you wish, overestimate his ignorance specifically on what was going in Ukraine. Mr. President Putin is very well aware of what really was happening in Kiev. He is very well aware of who uh, former President Yanukovych was. And he is very well aware what, what the uh, government, the current government in Ukraine is. Yes, there was a revolution, but the government was voted by 371 members of parliament, including all the members of the party of the regions, voted for the government. Yes, there are a few, a few radicals, but in general, these are professional people who have been engaged in their business for years. During the previous administration, one of, of these is here, and there are other. So, this is, uh, I mean, this is done for political reasons, just to, in any way, to justify and not to allow something of the sort happening in Russia. That's my explanation. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with uh, what has been just said here. I would just add to it, I think that the way I see things uh, developing is that uh, Russia and China are effectively rising as regional superpowers who do try to have and uh, enforce spheres of influence or regional powers. And I think the US is a reluctant global power, uh, which is trying to grope towards understanding how to handle it. Europe, even a larger economic power, but uh, even more reluctant in a way. And so I think we are in a very difficult new situation. And uh, I think, uh, that the gas discovery is actually helping a lot in the sense that it alleviates uh, some of the really tough constraints that would be imposed on the behavior uh, of the Western, Western countries. Um, I have a couple of points uh, just to wrap up. Uh, um, uh, we've reached 4 o'clock, which is really, uh, we've really gone over. Um, uh, but I just have a couple points on this. Um, Michael Kinsley, uh, the journalist, uh, uh, has a, a line that I like to use uh, where he says, uh, th there's something called a Kinsley gaffe. And a Kinsley gaffe is when a politician actually tells the truth. 
you know, and, and it usually only happens when they make a mistake. So the, the, the classic example is Gordon Brown uh, having a conversation with this woman uh, voicing these terrible anti-immigrant opinions. And then on camera, she's caught as saying, and then he's caught on camera walking away saying, boy, she was a racist. Well, he was right, right? You know, he was, he was absolutely right, but he got killed for it, you know? Mm -hmm. So one thing is we, we always have to be careful about what politicians say and what they think are not always the, the, the same thing. And that's, that's um, you know, uh, 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 th th that's one point. Um, another point is, you know, Brian Taylor has a nice piece in this monkey cage, uh, uh, a section that I, keep, um, uh, uh, that I keep plugging, where he says, you know, yes, that, that, that uh, President Putin has come to this world view which sees, you know, every pothole in Omsk as, as, as a CIA plot or, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, every time something bad happens in the world, there must be the, the hands of the West uh, behind it, but that we should recognize that. Um, and recognize that there are elements of truth to it and elements of myth making to it. Um, and, you know, none of the, uh, the positions I think that President Putin has taken are cut from whole cloth. I mean, Senator McCain goes to goes to the Maidan and appears on stage with one of the so-called right-wing uh, uh, politicians. That uh, I th I'm sure that that gets read very differently in Moscow than it does uh, uh, here. So uh, on the other hand, there are elements of it that are of the worldview that are, are clearly self-serving, and the fact that President Putin chose apparently to make this decision among this very small group of hardliners. Um, suggests that uh, 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 you know he's choosing where to get his advice from, uh, with probably the idea that he's a pretty good idea about the kind of advice that he's going to get, and it is we see it in a number of different areas in Russian decision making, where the number of people giving advice, I think at a high level, uh, seems to have narrowed. Now I'm not sitting, uh, you know, in in Red Square, so I. You know, this is all uh, a second hand, but it seems as if there's been many more policy surprises in the last uh, two years of Putin's um, uh, presidency than in the eight years before that. The decision to combine the courts, um, which is a very important decision, which caused a lot of friction between the kind of hardline security faction and the pro-business community in Moscow, seemed to come out of nowhere. Uh, there was a decision to give the um, uh, uh, the um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking now on the uh, the the, uh, uh, the the inspector's office uh, uh, the power to conduct um, uh, uh, inspections of businesses without the tax authorities, uh, which got a lot of people very nervous because this was a method that was used wisely to take over firms in the in the first decade, and that decision too seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, so I think there's a concern among you know, quite a few people who are watching Russia about whether the quality of information that President Putin is getting is as balanced as it was uh, uh, in the past. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you all for your patience. Uh, we've gone on for over two hours, um, which is longer than cla most class times at Columbia. Uh, uh, so maybe there must be something in the rules about uh, how we have to end after two hours. But the other problem is that we could go on all day. Um, and I do want to plug, we have another event tomorrow. We have another event on Wednesday where a lot of these same issues will be brought up. Again, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Merit Chano of SIPA for, for helping to, to co-sponsor the panel along with the, us at the Harriman Institute. And I want to thank our pal panelists for doing what I think was really a great job of illuminating a, a conflict that is so multifaceted and so complex that it's very difficult uh, to, to absorb in its entirety. And I want to uh, rec uh, um, um, uh, repeat the views here that there's no simple narratives here. There's no silver bullets. There's no easy answers. And I think a panel like this does a really good job of reminding everybody of the subtleties and the complexities of what's going on here. So thank you very much. And please join me in giving our panelists. <laughs>